apocalyptic universe of Mad Max. George Miller's vision of a future when petrol has become the most precious resource on Earth. Today, in the real world, there are sober voices warning that demand for oil could soon outstrip supply, with potentially devastating consequences for us all. I'm not a person who feels that Armageddon is coming, but we can have an awful lot of misery. If we get this wrong, we are all in very serious trouble. Today, the drilling rigs are operating in water that's three or four kilometers deep. Tomorrow, they could go deeper still. But at some stage, global production of oil will peak and begin a remorseless decline. The question is, how soon? I'm sure that we're talking here decades. So we're not hitting peak in 2010? We don't believe we are even in 2030. The worst case is that it's occurring now or very soon because the world is unprepared. It's absolutely unprepared. There are no quick fixes in something like this. Is a world addicted to cheap liquid energy facing the beginning of the end of the age of oil. In the ever-spreading suburbs of Australia's great cities, where mortgages are high and private transport indispensable, everyone's feeling the pinch. every day and you know, it really is expensive now it's just going up and up and we've got nothing no control over it have we not really yeah well, we've got two cars we must be spending say 120 dollars a week yeah I'm, I'm actually thinking about yeah a hybrid vehicle yeah so a toyota prius or something like that the precipitous rise in petrol prices is a global phenomenon in europe they're far higher Londoners are paying 90 pence a litre, around $2.20 Australian. Boys, the petrol is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting, yes. The causes are global too. There are many. But none of them is that the world is running out of oil. At least, not yet. But at the end of the day, you know, we're still suffering, aren't we? It's terrible. I was in America a uh, couple of weeks ago, and they're mainly about paying $3 for a gallon. So, yeah, it's very expensive over here. Three US dollars a gallon equates to just over one Australian dollar per litre. But in a nation where cheap fuel is considered a birthright, it's a price that hurts. In Houston, Texas, oil capital of the United States, gargantuan SUVs and pickup trucks far outnumber four-cylinder passenger cars. It's outrageous. It really is. Yeah, well, I need a big car. I'm, I'm a big man, so I need a big car. I didn't got so mad at you. Ever got so mad at something you just came and talk on it no more? Sixty bucks just to fill a little jet ski like this up. Drive it around for the day. That's it. Yep. It's out of control. Wait, what do I gotta do? Over here? You any idea why it's so high? Uh, no, not really. To be honest with you, I think it's uh, ridiculous. There's plenty of spots in the U.S. where we can drill and get our own oil instead of getting oil from overseas. And it's it's bullshit. Well, excuse my French, guys. <laughs> Many Americans seem to believe that it's their dependence on imported oil that's the problem. Others blame gougers and speculators for driving up the price. And indeed, as the price of oil has soared from under 30 to over 70 US dollars a barrel in just two years, the hedge funds and the traders have moved in. This is NYMEX the New York Mercantile Exchange, the most important single marketplace for crude oil in the world. The deals made here more than anywhere else determine the global price of oil. 
Ray Carbone is a veteran trader of crude oil features and options. It's a zero-sum game. Somebody wins, that means someone's lost. The dealer's clients might be oil companies and airlines trying to lock in costs far into the future, or banks and hedge funds trying to make a buck next week. That hot money can drive the price up or down day by day. But Carbone insists that the real-world fundamentals of supply, demand and risk determine the long-term price. What is the main reason, do you think, that the price of oil is now double what it was three years ago? If I had to choose one reason, I would look at the demand side of the equation. And on that demand side of the equation are three billion new consumers that are real players in the marketplace that were not players three to five years ago, and that's the Chinese and the Indian. Thirty years ago, China was a net oil exporter. Now, as its GDP leaps by 9% per year, it's become the second biggest importer of crude oil in the world, trailing only the United States. The surging demand from the developing giants of East and South Asia is testing the capacity of the global industry. There was underinvestment in the 90s when oil was cheap. Now there aren't enough oil wells, there aren't enough tankers, there aren't enough refineries. To make matters worse, many of the world's most important oil producers are in actual or potential political turmoil. Iran, Iraq, Nigeria, Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, Russia, I'm, well, everybody has that in mind. These above-ground factors, says the Paris-based International Energy Agency, are driving the price up, not a shortage of oil in the ground. The market is afraid that in case of a supply disruption, there will not be enough capacity to overcome it, to produce enough oil and enough product to cope with the supply disruption anywhere. That's the reason why prices are so high. In fact, oil prices in the past few years have far outstripped the IEA's predictions. In Washington, too, there are red faces. The Energy Information Administration in the US Department of Energy marshals global statistics to forecast the price of energy. Just a year ago, it was predicting that crude oil would soon be back to 30 US dollars a barrel. Now it, like the IEA, forecasts that $50 is as low as the price will go. The American agency puts the blame for its error on a lack of investment, not a lack of oil. Mainly because we aren't seeing the investment made to bring forth productive capacity from the resources that we believe are there. And that's largely in, uh, in OPEC member countries where we thought there'd be more investment made for one reason or another investment is slower than we thought. The fact that the official agencies got their forecasts so wrong is not encouraging, especially when a growing chorus of oil engineers and resource scientists warn that we ain't seen nothing yet. Demand, they say, is about to outstrip supply of the world's most important commodity. The village of Bally de Hob, at the southwestern tip of Ireland, is where petroleum geologist Colin Campbell has ended up after a lifetime roaming the world, from Bolivia to Papua New Guinea, Illinois to Norway. It was while he was working for Norway's Statoil, he tells me, that he first became interested in the concept of peak oil. He likes to explain the basics over a pint or three of Murphy's Stout. We could think about this glass here, compare it with the North Sea back in the 60s. Here was a, a new area just full of black, beautiful liquid, just marvelous. Now the North Sea's oil is half gone. 